I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker for today. Uh, Savala Nolan is an author, professor, and lawyer. She is the author of Don't Let It Get You Down, Essays on Race, Gender, and the Body, uh, and is the executive director of the Felton E. Henderson Center for Social Justice at the University of California, Berkeley School of Law. And this is where she teaches about the role of identity in lawyering. She and her writing have been featured in Vogue, the New York Times Book Review, Time, Harper's Magazine, Forbes, and more. Last year, Nolan served as an advisor on the Peabody Award-winning podcast, The Promise. Born and raised in California, she lives in the San Francisco Bay Area with her family. So thank you so much, Savala, for being here with us today, and uh, the reins are yours. Thank you, Leo, for that very friendly introduction. And of course, for the invitation to spend some time with you and this community. Uh, Ohio has a very special place in my heart because I used to live in Michigan. So of course I don't root for Ohio when it comes to sports, but um, I worked in Cincinnati off and on and love Ohio and also have family roots there. So it's especially nice for that reason to uh, hang out with you all this morning. So as you know, because you registered for this event, um, I'm gonna be talking about fat phobia or anti-fat bias as some call it and um, what it is, what it isn't, what role it plays in our lives, um, the political uses of anti-fat bias and fat phobia. And I'm gonna be flying at a pretty high level because this is a very complicated topic and um, there's an increasingly rich body of literature and information about fat phobia and anti-fat bias. So pretty much any slide that I share, we could spend a whole hour digging deeper and deeper into. But since we only have an hour together, um, my goal for today is really to um, help plant some seeds of concepts and vocabulary um, that are rooted in undermining anti-fat bias. So again, flying at a high level. And my hope is that you take away um, a variety of ideas that perhaps inspire you to dig deeper and learn more about those ideas. And as Leo said, we'll have a little bit of time for question and answer um, at the end of my presentation. And so maybe we'll cover some of, some of that together. The way I've organized uh, my talk for y'all today is in basically three parts. So we'll start with a little bit of level setting, um, defining what anti-fat bias and what fat phobia are, what fatness is. And then um, as we move on, we'll think about how fat phobia and anti-fat bias impact us personally. And we'll do that by exploring um, what it's about and what it's not about. And then we'll move into Q&A. And if we were together, I'd probably ask for some volunteers um, from the audience, because I like to ask people to sort of engage by reading some of the material or answering questions, but we're not. So unfortunately, I'm going to be talking a lot, but um, I will get to hear from you at the end. So let me go ahead and share my screen and we can dive in. Okay. Leo, can you just give me a thumbs up that that looks right? A verbal or visual thumbs up that folks can see? Yes, I can see your slides. Okay, terrific. Well, let us begin. If there is one thing and only one thing that I would love for you to take away from um, this time that we spent together, if there's only one thing, it's this. The only thing that you can tell by looking at a fat person is what kind of prejudice and prejudgments you have about fat people. That's it. You can't tell if they're healthy, whatever that means. We'll get into that. 
you can't tell what kind of eating or movement and exercise habits they have. You can't tell if they have high self-esteem or low self-esteem. You can't tell if they are um, having a lot of hot sex. I hope I can say that. <laughs> uh, you can't tell if they want to be thin or if they're happy being fat. You can't tell any of that. All you can tell is what is pre-existing in your own mind about fat people. That's the main thing I hope you take away from today. Let's see. There we go. So again, let's start with some level setting around what fat phobia and anti-fat bias actually are. And I'll pause here just to say that um, I use the terms fat phobia and anti-fat bias interchangeably. But um, there are people who think that there's this distinction between them and it's a really interesting question. And so um, if this appeals to you, like if you're into sort of the fine distinctions of parsing language, which probably some of you are given that this is a collegiate environment, I would encourage you to Google um, the work of Aubrey Gordon and her name will show up at the end of the presentation um, who has a really interesting article about the difference between fat phobia and anti-fat bias as she understands it, but I, I'll use them sort of interchangeably. So anti-fat bias is essentially a form of bigotry that positions fat people as inferior or as objects of hatred and derision. This uh, definition comes from Virgie Tovar, who's a scholar and an activist um, and has written a terrific book called You Have the Right to Remain Fat that I recommend. I love Virgie's definition because it includes the word bigotry, which is a strong word. And it's not a word that we necessarily associate with how we think about fat people, but it's really accurate, right? Anti-fat bias and fat phobia are indeed forms of bigotry. And I love that she highlights that. And I love that this definition includes this idea of positionality because the effect of fat phobia and anti-fat bias is that it pushes fat people further outside um, what scholar John Powell calls the circle of human concern, right? It pushes them, it positions them as being um, further from the center of worth and of, um, of worth. Let's leave it at that. So I love that Virgie includes, includes those in her definition. Some other ways to think about it. The culturally constructed beliefs and habits that create an irrational preference for people who are thin or for thinness right? These are not inborn preferences. They're culturally constructed and they're not actually rooted in um, anything rational as we'll see, right? It's an irrational preference. Fat phobia includes the blaming, the shaming, the fear, the teasing, the controlling, and the erasure um, and violence toward people who are fat. It's also the heart and soul of diet culture or the war on obesity. Um, and I would even venture to say it's the heart and soul of a lot of wellness culture, which is sort of um, maybe replaced diet culture as dieting has sort of fallen out of favor as a concept. Wellness has sort of replaced it, but at its roots, a lot of it is about being thinner than you currently are. Fat phobia and anti-fat bias are systemic and individual. So they happen just between human beings and they happen um, through larger systems that organize society. And I include this photograph um, of the same person. And what I normally do if we're together is ask someone to tell me what kind of photograph this is, or you know, ask for a show of hands. Um, for people who recognize the type of this, what type of photo this is. And every single time, pretty much everyone in the room instantly recognizes it as a before and after photograph, which it is. The before meaning kind of before the diet, before the weight loss, before this person got their life together, and then after, right? It's meant to contrast these two moments in time. And I include the photograph simply because it shows us how quick, how quick the connection is between seeing this 
and fat phobia and anti-fat bias. Like it illustrates, we don't need any context for this photograph. We don't need a caption. We don't need anything to read it. And that's because anti-fat bias and fat phobia um, are deeply, deeply embedded in our culture and as a result in our psyches. So we do it pretty darn quickly. It's pretty reflexive to call up fat phobia and anti-fat bias um, in our minds. Fat phobia and anti-fat bias are harmful. They're made up and they're in no way inevitable or natural. And we'll dig into these a little bit more. Again, right now, I'm just sort of level setting. I wanna emphasize that just because something is made up doesn't mean it isn't important, right? Time is made up, money is made up. These are human inventions, you know, they're human conventions that we all sort of agree to follow by, abide by this system of money or the system of time. Um, and they're incredibly important. So just because fat phobia is made up doesn't mean it, it, it has no real impact, right? It's important to distinguish between fat phobia and anti-fat bias, however, and fat or fatness, right? Um, the former are really problematic, but the latter are just neutral descriptors, right? Fat and fatness are descriptors like tall or purple or cold. Their natural realities are just part of body diversity on this planet. Um, and they're also political identities, right? I'm black and I use the capital B when I write the word black and blackness is a descriptor, it's a part of diversity on the planet and it also is a political identity. So for many fat people such as myself, using fat as a descriptor um, is a statement of our political non-neutrality, right? It's a statement of wanting to co-opt or return or reclaim the word fat for ourselves as opposed to have it be something that is so pathologized and directed at us in a harmful way. So um, that's worth recognizing too. And of course, fat and fatness are totally fine. They're not bad, they're not wrong, they're not weird, they just are. So one way that, that can be helpful to think about it is sort of to compare it to race, like race isn't bad, racism is bad. Fatness is not bad, anti-fat bias is bad. So again, just doing a little bit of level setting as we move into this. Now, why are we talking about this here in this particular room, so to speak? So I pulled the quote in orange from the DE&I um, webpage of the Ohio State University. And I love it. It says, we exemplify a transformed college where diversity, equity, and inclusion are institutionalized values. So important that they become institutionalized that are embraced, practiced, and celebrated. And all members of the CFAES community are supported in developing to their highest potential. Beautiful, right? Well, body diversity, underlining diversity, is simply a fact of life and we should embrace it. Fat phobia and anti-fat bias are inimical to inclusion. Remember that Virgie Tovar um, definition where she talks about positioning, right? Anti-fat bias positions fat people as other, as sort of outside the circle of normalness, the circle of human concern. It's inimical to inclusion. And because fat phobia and anti-fat bias impact us all, whether you're thin or fat or somewhere in between, whether like me, you've been both over the course of time, um, fat phobia and anti-fat bias are really like the water that we're swimming in. We're all impacted by it. And part of um, how we know that is because so many of you, even though we're not together, I'm gonna hazard to guess, so many of you were able to immediately understand that what you, you were seeing was a before and after photo on that, that earlier slide, right? Um, the artifacts of anti-fat bias are embedded in how we view the world, whether we are fat or thin. Okay, still level setting here. 
Um, I'm just going to pause to say, Leo, I see that there's a lot happening in the chat. I'm not looking at it, but I know you're going to pop in if I need to start paying attention to it. I just, uh, just so you know, I, I changed the chat so folks can communicate with each other because they're sharing resources. But Oh, great. You know. Oh, fantastic. Oh, I can't wait to look through it. Okay. So how do we know someone is fat, right? It's like, oh, we look at them, but really like, what does that mean? Well, medically speaking, the BMI chart is what tells us whether we are fat, right? Um, the BMI chart is incredibly problematic. And this is like a particular moment where we could spend an hour unpacking the BMI chart. And I thought about doing that, but there's so much that I wanna share with you. Um, that what I'm going to do instead of a deep dive into the BMI chart is like a mini dive and encourage you to do a deep dive if this interests you. Um, the long and short of it is that the BMI chart, which you have probably seen like tacked up in a doctor's office, or maybe you've Googled it or you've read about it in a magazine, um, was never intended to be used to determine health. It was never intended to be used on individuals. And it was never even intended to be used as a way of understanding um, the correlation between body weight and body size and well-being. It was intended for, for other things, right? And in this country, in the United States, about 50 years ago, um, the medical industry and the insurance industry sort of yanked it out of its native habitat and began using it for an unintended purpose, which is to sort of diagnose whether an individual is too fat based on their height. That's not what it is meant to do, and it doesn't do it very well. It's sort of like if we decided to gauge. Um, who should get into the Ohio State University based on how well they rode a bicycle. Like it's just, there's not really a correlation and measuring how well someone rides a bicycle doesn't really indicate or have anything to do with how well they'll do in college or what their contributions to the community might be and so on and so forth. So it's a misused tool. Um, and as we'll see in, in a second, it's a tool that tells us that pretty much everybody has a weight problem, right, in this country. So medically speaking, we look at the BMI chart, but like in an everyday sense, just kind of running your errands, going through your life, whether your fat depends on the size, shape, weight, and textures of your body compared to someone else's, it's a comparative judgment. And it's in the eye of the beholder. Like you might look at somebody and think, wow, they're fat when whatever that means in your mind. And someone else might look at them and think they're not, you know? So you'll notice these three columns of images and um, the caption at the bottom, overweight, obese, and morbidly obese. Those are BMI categories. And there's a great website called the BMI Project where people um, post a photograph of themselves with what the BMI chart says um, they are, overweight, or obese, or obese, or morbidly obese. So I don't know. I just finished telling you it's in the eye of the beholder. But if you look at these people, very few people walking down the street, I think, would look at the first category and say overweight. And I think that's the same for the obese category. Again, these are BMI categories. Morbidly obese, I don't know. I mean, first of all, that's such a bizarre term, right? It sort of implies that you're so fat that uh, death is imminent, right? Um, interestingly enough, the person at the top is Sarah Robles, an Olympic athlete who is an outstanding metabolic health. And the person at the bottom is our beloved Lizzo. And I don't know if any of you have ever seen Lizzo perform live or watched her workout videos on Instagram. Like this woman is in outstanding physical shape. So 
there's kind of a funny irony um, that these particular bodies that are obese by BMI standards are um, considered sort of deathly obese, right? Now, on the left side of the screen, you see this sort of delineated cluster of, according to the BMI, overweight and obese people. And surely when we talk about anti-fat bias and fat phobia, these folks in the little dotted section may be impacted, right? But mostly the hammer is gonna come down really hard on the people who are not in that little sort of spotted square. It's gonna come down on the people who we generally look at and think fat, right? It's gonna come down on people with larger bodies for the most part. Now, where does anti-fatness show up? It shows up all over the place, okay? And we're still level setting. We're still just kind of getting oriented at a very high level, 40,000 feet to what we're talking about. Anti-fat bias shows up in families. Oh my gosh, it's so family driven. It comes up uh, with food policing, with parenting, with bonding. I mean, raise your hand if you've ever kind of bonded with anyone in your family around dieting or getting thinner or feeling fat or the Christmas cookies or whatever, right? It shows up in movies, TV, magazines, books, video games, stories. What I think of as the cultural field of vision, right? What we see, who we see, what we look at, who we look at. You see it among friends and significant others. Really often for women, it, it looks like bonding. Um, and sometimes like food policing, your inner monologue has it. I feel so fat today. You see it in employment and medicine where there is just so much data around the discrimination that fat people face and getting care and compensation on the job. You see it in access to self-expression and self-documentation. Um, way less than when I was growing up. I mean, when I was a fat kid in the eighties, it was like, Forget it, there were no clothes. Now there's a wider variety of clothing for fat people to wear, but it still can be an issue. And um, I include self-documentation here in photography because of all the times that we have seen a photograph of ourselves and thought, oh, I look fat or I look fatter than I think I do, or wow, God, I should go on a diet or all the times that we have not wanted to be photographed because we're afraid of looking fat. Um, there is a way that anti-fatness actually impacts our willingness to leave evidence of our existence and our life experience, right? Because we resist photographs in particular. Of course, you see it in diets and exercise. It's almost impossible to imagine or engage with um, the notion of how you move your body and what you feed yourself without weight and thinness and size kind of like inching into that conversation. You see it in access to spaces. And I mean that literally and, and also not literally like um, airplane seats would be a literal example. Um, another example that's not so literal would be like a pool party where um, it may not be difficult to physically fit in the space or to have the space accommodate your body in a comfortable way, but you may nevertheless feel um, ashamed or unwelcome or reluctant to enter and occupy the space. And of course, uh, we see it in our own behavior around food and exercise, which I guess is sort of redundant to the prior bullet point. This is a slide where I very often ask people to help me read it, but since we're remote, you just have to keep hearing my voice and I apologize for that, but it is um, the lay of the land in this Zoom world. So I wanna focus a little bit more on that cultural field of vision. And invite you to think with me about what fat people are like in that field of vision you know, which you could also think of as popular culture. Another way to imagine this 
is an exploration of how we're taught to think about fat people, right? So let's go through this bullet point list. Fat people are often funny, jolly, the jokester, like think of kind of sitcoms, you know, often using their fatness as the butt of the joke. They might be menacing and scary like Ursula and the Little Mermaid, who's actually one of my favorite characters, but you know, that's a different talk. Uh, they're often depicted as greedy, gluttonous, and lazy, dumb or ignorant, sexless and unattractive. You know, the, the sort of very common trope is the friend, not the leading lady. They're often uh, depicted as damaged, traumatized, or using food to cope. Like their fatness is the result of something bad that happened. And the only way that they have been able to deal with it is by eating too much. Um, they're depicted as wishing they were thin, right? Like unhappy with their body, trying to be thin. As having a thin person inside them who's the real them. You know, even Oprah said that in a Weight Watchers commercial, right? That inside every fat woman is a thin woman who wants to get out. Maybe she shouldn't use the word woman, but the phrasing was approximately that. That's utter bullshit, but um, Leo, I'm sorry, I didn't ask if I could swear, swear but it's utter BS, um, but it's what we're, we're taught to believe. Fat people are often living a small life, like not their best life, you know, and then maybe if they get thin, life kind of opens up. They're often out of shape, inactive, generally unhealthy, abnormal or deviant, like they're the only fat person, there's something abnormal about their body. They might be depicted as dirty or contagious or having let themselves go, unhappy taking up too much space, which of course makes us ask, is that space that belongs to thin people? Like, what does that even mean? They're depicted as overeating, binging, and always eating unwholesome food, defined by their fatness, like that's their primary trait. They're sometimes depicted as being outside the binary gender norms. And I don't include this as an endorsement of the gender binary, but just as an observation that fat men are often um, not masculine enough and fat women aren't feminine enough, right? There's something kind of feminine about a fat man and sort of masculine about a fat woman in a way that is unsettling to um, the binary. And that's when you see us at all, right? Because for the most part, we're just invisible. I wanna draw your attention to this phrase in the blue square, symbolic annihilation. It comes from sociology and it refers to the media or the cultures underrepresentation or inaccurate representation or erasure of marginalized groups as the means of maintaining the status quo or social inequality. Add that to your um, vocabularies because when you have um, sort of a frame for what we're describing in terms of the symbolic annihilation, you'll start to see it everywhere. Okay, we're gonna do a little quiz. If you have a pen and paper, fantastic, you can use it if you wanna you know, open up something on your laptop, that's fine. Or you can just take kind of mental inventory. You don't have to actually write anything. So how can you gauge your level of an exposure to fat phobia and anti-fat bias? Here we go. Don't be scared. You're all going to ace the quiz. I'll read the questions and just think about the answer. You don't have to write it down. Do your movies, TV, magazine feeds, et cetera, include or feature fat people living rich, complex lives? Have you ever altered or controlled how you eat or exercise with the goal of making your body smaller or preventing it from getting larger? Have you ever used the fear or dislike of fatness to bond with friends and family? Do you have quote fat days that make you feel bad, crappy, or like you need a plan to lose weight and get back in control? Have you ever chosen not to wear something because it think, you think it makes you look or feel fat? Have you ever chosen to wear something because it makes you feel skinny? 
Have you ever chosen not to do something because you felt too fat or weren't yet thin enough? Have you ever avoided or wanted to avoid being with or near someone because they're fat? Have you ever been secretly kind of excited about getting sick because you might lose a few pounds? Have you ever enjoyed being with or near someone fat because you looked thin by comparison? How would you feel? Like, would this be cool or not cool? If you learned you were gonna gain 25 pounds this year, even if your health did not change, how would you react or do you react if someone describes you as fat? That's the quiz. I never ask people to share their answers, um, but my guess is that for 99% of you, um, going through this list of 12 questions demonstrates some of the ways that anti-fat bias and fat phobia are part of your life and probably have been for a long time. This seems like a really good place to remind y'all of the one thing I want you to take away from our time together. If, if only one thing sticks, it's that the only thing you can tell by looking at a fat person is what kind of prejudice and prejudgments you have about fat people. That's it. Okay. We've done our level setting. We're all kind of on roughly the same page, at least for the moment, um, about some of the very basics. And now we get to dig into some really interesting stuff, right? If fat phobia is made up, which it is, um, and persistent, what's, which it is, why? Like, what is it about? And what is it not about, right? We tend to think it's about beauty and health. Um, but is that really true? Okay, you probably know what I think and I'm gonna tell you what I think in case you're, you're wondering. So what fat phobia is not about, it's not about health, it's not about taste or beauty or aesthetics and it's not about sort of a modern epidemic that we need all hands on deck to solve. Again, I'm going to be flying at a very high level and I, I just wanna encourage you to make a mental note of what you find interesting and dig deeper um, at some point after, after our time together. So the, the fundamental idea that I want to share with you, like if there's only kind of one thing that I want you to um, wrap your head around, it's this. We tend to think that fat phobia and anti-fat bias um, are about health because we tend to think that fatness is what makes you unhealthy and thinness is what makes you healthy. We tend to think that they go together in a causal way, right? Not just correlation, I'm talking about cause, that being fat causes you to have disease and being thin um, causes you not to have disease, right? The reality is that health is incredibly complex. It is nowhere near as simple as the size of your body or the weight of your body. And one of the ways that I want to illustrate this is simply by drawing your attention to the social determinants of health, okay? Sure, what you choose to eat and how you choose to move your body, even if they have no impact on weight, like that can impact health, right? But health is incredibly complex. Think about whether, and I'm just gonna kind of cherry pick from this list, think about how much harder it is to create and maintain health regardless of weight if you don't have a house, okay? If you live in a zip code that is filled with industrial waste, if you're unemployed, if you can't read, if you don't have a doctor who speaks your language fluently, if you're under tremendous stress, if you don't have a good doctor, right? You could have a doctor, but the quality can be very low. This is all to say it has so much more to do 
um, or there are so many things that contribute to health beyond whether your breakfast is a donut or oatmeal. Like, okay, that's in there, sure. The body responds to food in different ways and that is real. But it's about way, way, way more than just what we eat. Health is incredibly complex. Moreover, fat people can be healthy and thin people can be sick. Body fat and body weight are not indicators of metabolic health. They just simply are not. There are no studies. And I encourage you to Google this and I'm happy to share um, citations via Leo. There are no studies indicating that body fat and body weight are reliable indicators of metabolic health. You can improve metabolic health without losing weight or while gaining weight. What really matters is health supporting behavior, okay? And health supporting, um, you know, social determinants, of course, but I wanna focus on that piece that's like individual right now. So health supporting behavior matters, right? But even those don't correlate with or control body weight. This person on the left, why am I, or on the right, maybe it's your left, I'm blanking on her name. Ah, I'm blanking on her name, but she is a triathlete. Um, if I remember her name, I will share it later. And uh, happens to be in very good metabolic health. And I include this picture just as a visual illustration that body weight and body size do not necessarily correlate with metabolic health. And lastly, I'll just add that health includes mental and emotional health, which we know diets consistently erode. Talking about health is important, but it's also important for me to remind y'all that health is actually not an obligation and it's not an on off switch, right? Health is not a moral imperative, especially in a world that doesn't make it easy for everyone to be healthy. Think about those social determinants of health, for instance. Sickness should not be a source of shame, but it very often is for fat people. And one example of this is pre-diabetes as it's called, or diabetes. When fat people get diabetes or pre-diabetes diagnosis, it is almost always blamed on their body weight. And because we view fatness through this cultural lens of derision, this flood of shame sort of rises up, right? When thin people get diabetes, they really don't necessarily feel shame for their weight because they're thin, right? So Halle Berry has type two diabetes and so does Tom Hanks. But when you look at pictures of them, you don't like immediately think, oh, well, duh, they gave it to themselves, right? If you look at a picture of like Paula Dean, you might think that, well, you know, look at her. That's, of course she has diabetes, right? So um, it's important to remember that sickness should never ever be a source of shame. And even people who are not in perfect health for whatever reason or in whatever way deserve dignity, respect, joy, and full access to society, period. Moreover, most of us are healthy and unhealthy at the same time, right? We might have great blood pressure, but we might have troubles with our blood sugar, or we might have, you know, terrific cholesterol, but need um, the use of an SSRI to help manage depression, right? Health is dynamic. It's so much more complicated than what you eat and how much you exercise. And it's certainly much more complicated than what your body weighs. Everybody still with me? Yes? Okay, excellent. Fat phobia is also not about taste or aesthetics or beauty. A taste or preference for thinness is created and then reinforced. You're not born with it. It isn't universal across place or time, including our own. It isn't like a natural human preference. And it's inextricably linked to anti-Black racism and colonialism. Again, here's one where we could spend so much time, but I just want to like kind of start the wheels turning, right? I'm just, we're kind of just touching on a lot of different topics and I'm hoping that um, some of you will, will be inspired to look deeper into some of these topics. This image on the upper right, you know, it's this ad for ironized yeast, which ugh, just sounds gross. But the irony, of course, is that this dude here with the glasses is like encouraging women to gain weight, right? 
And why, why do we think this is? Is this so that they will have like, I don't know, do better in their master's programs? Is it um, so that they'll have a more profound relationship with, you know, the God that they believe in? No, it's so they'll look hot in a bathing suit, okay? Um, but what's interesting here is that like, this, this image depicts a particular moment in time where for whatever reason, the preference was a little bit more voluptuous. The image below that is of a young woman uh, from a community in Mauritania where, fat, and a, like a modern current community where fatness is prized. And um, much like women often diet before a wedding here, um, girls and women in this community um, attempt to gain weight before sort of going on the marriage market. So it's the inverse of what we tend to do in pop culture in the United States. Um, and these images are just to illustrate to you that this is not a universal preference, right? It's not inborn, it's cultural. I wanna spend a little more time on anti-Black racism and a wee bit more time on colonialism um, because it's, it can be very powerful to understand that some of the anti-fat bias that you have learned and that you sort of act out is also connected to this project of white dominance and of settler colonialism. It can be really helpful to understand the depth of those political hooks. So I'm gonna read this quote from Sabrina Strings who wrote Fearing the Black Body. To justify human slavery, oh wait, I'm sorry, this is my quote, <laughs> but the quotes within it, the examples are from Sabrina Strings, but this is my own work. So to justify human slavery and the racism that followed, it was economically, morally, and politically essential to degrade blackness and uplift whiteness. One way this manifested was using media to portray thinness as a symbol of control, restraint, discipline, grace, and intelligence, and associating it with whiteness. At the same time, fatness became a symbol of gluttony, laziness, lack of self-control, and lack of discipline, and was associated, purposefully associated, y'all, with blackness. In 1836, the popular women's magazine, Godey's Lady, Lady's Book, urged white readers to curtail the amount of food they ate in the interest of beauty, warning that excessive eating created an African seeming body that was improper for a white woman. 1836, so that's the United States pre-Civil War. In 1897, this is after the Civil War, of course, Harper's Magazine declared that to be fat is to be miserable for a white woman wanting social success, suggesting with sardonic disdain that a fat white woman could only be desirable if she burnt cork herself. In other words, if she darkened her skin with burnt cork to look black, right? I'm touching briefly on colonialism. Europeans making contact with indigenous people sought ways to differentiate civilized European culture from uncivilized indigenous cultures. This helped to justify settler colonialism as a national practice. So same um, logic, right? In order to like pull off slavery, you have to dehumanize the enslaved. And in order to kind of pull off the gym, mental gymnastics of settler colonialism, you've got to somehow undermine the humanity of the people that you're trying to colonize. As with anti-Blackness in the United States, colonial projects overseas associated the roundness they observed in bodies in Africa, India, et cetera, with too much appetite, a lack of dis discipline, laziness, savagery, a lack of cultivation, and with a need to be controlled. What really strikes me is that um, these associations, lack of discipline, laziness, the need to be controlled. Those are still how we think about fat bodies, right? We're still making the same associations. 
The last thing I want to say about what fat phobia is not about is this. It's not about a new epidemic or a modern problem. And what I mean by that is that fat people have always existed and will always exist because body diversity is real and some bodies are fat, full stop. For as long as we have been depicting ourselves, photographing ourselves, painting ourselves, for as long as we have been depicting ourselves, we have been depicting fatness. You with me? Okay. Let's talk about what fat phobia is about. Remember, it's made up, it is pervasive, it is widespread. Why, why, why is it here? What is the work that it's doing in our culture and who is benefiting from it? Well, <clears throat> first and foremost, I think that fat phobia and anti-fat bias are about political sedation, especially for women. And I use that term as inclusively as possible. Of course, male identified people, men um, are subject to fat phobia as are queer, gender queer people and people outside the gender binary. The hammer just comes down particularly hard on women and political sedation is part of why. Sonia Renee Taylor, who's an activist and a writer, uh, has a fabulous, fabulous observation, which is that if white women took the energy that they put into controlling the size and shape of their body, right, into being thin or not being fat, and diverted it to deconstructing white dominance and put it all into anti-racist work, racism, gone. So there's a way that when you are extremely focused on whether your snack should be the donut or the apple and what you weigh and what size your pants are, um, there's very little room left to be focused on some of the deeper, more political questions that proliferate in our culture. Whatever your political leanings are, I mean, obviously I'm progressive, but this applies to anybody. It's a form of profound distraction that has political consequences. It's about control and denigration. I quoted earlier from this fabulous book by Sabrina Strings, my friend and colleague. Um, and, and one of the things that she says in this book that I love is that anti-fat bias or the fear of fatness is used to control white women and to denigrate black women. And the women who are neither white nor black who are in between, you know, they're sort of just jostling to check, kind of figure out which side they're on in this question, right? So um, the example that uh, Professor Strings gives is that for white women, like we saw in those two magazines a few slides ago, it's about control, right? And, and controlling the body um, is a way to hold on to some of the benefits of whiteness. Because if your body starts to kind of not look white, there's this old joke about like, oh, I know I've gained too much weight when the black men start hitting on me at the club, right? When your body starts to like get bigger, there's a way that, um, it's not quite as white, quote unquote, as whiteness or white dominance wants the body to be. So it's a way of control for, for white women. And for black women, it's a form of denigration, right? Think about those adjectives that we talked about, laziness, needing to be controlled, uh, needing to be controlled, unintelligent, right? It's a, it's a way of shaming and diminishing um, black women because of the associations between fatness and thinness and blackness and whiteness. Of course, it's about money, <laughs> right? Like uh, dieting is a $72 billion industry. Um, and what's really fascinating is that there are no studies, there are none 
that show that um, controlling body weight through diet and exercise and through surgery is sustainable or works beyond two to five years. There are none. What they show is that within about two to five years from at least 98% of people, the body regains the weight. And that's um, something we could spend the whole conversation on, like what is the biology of that? But even without understanding the biology, we know that it's true. All of this is a fancy way of saying diets don't work. And these companies know that. Repeat customers are part of Weight Watchers business model. They don't advertise it, but it's part of the business model and it's about money. I also think that fat phobia and anti-fat bias are about separation. Um, they're about preventing fellowship. This is an ad from a magazine for a clothing company. And what fascinates me about the ad is that there are thin women and fat women in the same image. And that is incredibly rare, right? And when you have a group of people that society designates as unsavory, gross, out of control, kind of undesirable, a little bit contagious, of course, that creates a wall of separation. And separation is a very powerful political tool. So political sedation, as I've said, is part of it, but the separation is part of it too. Here are three quotes that ordinarily I would ask folks to read for me just to mix up the voice that you're hearing, but I will read them myself. Dieting is a process by which a woman shows her ability to understand her role in society. That comes from fat scholar, Sandra Gilman. A culture fixated on female thinness is not an obsession about female beauty but an obsession about female obedience. And that's from Naomi Wolf. Fat liberation requires thin traitors. And that's from Stanley Rachetoir. And I love that quote because it calls people who are thin to um, do some of their own work around looking, how, looking at how fat phobia is embedded in their own lives and finding ways to be a little bit traitorous to the system of weight suppression and weight control and anti-fat bias that governs so much of our lives and that is so deeply embedded in how we look at the world. Think back to that before and after picture, right? It's almost reflexive. Okay, but wait, I know some of you are probably freaking out a little bit and thinking, shouldn't we do something about all the fat people out there? Like, what are we going to do? Have you walked through an airport lately? There's so many fat people. Oh my God, right? Um, and my answer is, no, we really should not do anything about fat people's bodies, okay? There's nothing to fix and there's nothing to change. Partly that's because attempting to suppress or control weight does not work. There's no studies, remember, that show that it works. What they show is that it results in weight, weight gain and emotional and mental health declines. Moreover, let's remember that you can be fat and healthy at the same time, that exercise and food do not correlate with the size and shape of your body. And instead, apologies for that, um, instead of being fixated on the size and shape of people's bodies, especially fat people's bodies, we should focus on creating universal access to the meaningful and significant factors in health outcomes and focus on weight neutral self care, right? Now, that's a political project. And when thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions of us are wrapped up in trying to get from a size 18 to a 14 by summer vacation, we don't necessarily have the energy that it takes or the stamina that it takes to urge the creation of this universal access. Um, so it's a sort of self-fulfilling cycle with the political sedation, right? But there are ways to break free of it. And the kind of conversation that we're having today is part of that. Okay, one last time. 
the only thing you can tell by looking at a fat person is what kind of prejudice and free judgments you have about fat people. That's it. That's all you can tell. That's it. Nothing else. One of the solutions to some of the problems that I've described, there are many, but one is to pay attention to fat positive voices on Instagram and in the media, you know, they're out there. If you want to take a screenshot of this or Leo, I could send you the list of these names. These folks are some of my favorites. Um, Aubrey Gordon right here is the one who wrote the article about anti-fat bias. Um, versus fat phobia as, uh, in terms of rhetoric and linguistics. And these are great places and people to start with. Thank you so much for listening to me for an hour. Oh my gosh, I like the sound of my voice and even I feel sorry for you. Um, keep in touch with me on Instagram or Twitter if you like. You can also email me through my website if you have questions. Um, and I'm very happy to take questions from the audience at this point. I'm going to stop my screen share and join with my face. So Lala, thank okay. you so much for that fantastic um, presentation. Oh, you're so welcome. Uh, tons of comments, people relating stories, sharing resources. Um, the session is going to continue for 15 minutes. So please stick around if you want to engage in dialogue with Savala. We're going to uh, address a couple of questions that came up. Okay. And um, yes, but if you have to go, we understand. I just put the link to the feedback survey in the chat box. If you wouldn't mind filling that out, that would be fantastic. Some of you have recommendations for other topics and deeper dives into this topic, as well as potential speakers, and we want to hear from you. So there was a question a long time ago, but um, you showed the same slide over and over again. It was your main <laughs> takeaway. And then I noticed the same trend, but the person asked uh, a question about the, the photos being predominantly of women or women appearing bodies mm -hmm. and wondered if things played out differently for men or trans folks. And you did hint at this later on about the hammer hitting pretty hard on women. I think illustrated pretty well how that plays out, but I thought I'd give you an opportunity to address the gender differences with respect to fat phobia. Yeah, I'm glad that that came up. And I, you know, I have to confess that I am not a scholar on that particular sort of subset of issues. But um, what I will say is, you know, I'm, I'm guessing that the person who posed this question already knows this. So I'm not saying it to them so much as to the whole room then of course you can't necessarily tell someone's gender identity by looking at them either. And Leo, you kind of surface that in how you frame the question, right? Which is in those images, some of the people appear to be this or that. Um, some of the people in those images are gender queer and they use they pronouns. I suppose I've never actually had this question before. So I've never thought about whether I should add that information and I will think about that. But um, to be sure, this impacts everyone, thin or fat. And if you're talking about people in fat bodies, it impacts men, it impacts women, it impacts genderqueer folks, it impacts trans folks, um, and not necessarily all in the same way, right? So um, if you think about a person who is trans, well, let me back up a little bit more and just say, um, there is a gendered way that anti-fat bias and fat phobia work, right? So they feel a little bit um, different depending on the gender space that a person occupies. They show up a little bit differently. And um, one example of that is this notion that sort of men who are fat like have, have a quote unquote less masculine body or presence. And that women who are fat have a less sort of feminine body or presence. You know, that's one of the ways that it shows up with the kind of binary and normativity. For trans folks, I'm not trans. And so I can't speak on that from any personal experience. But what I can say as um, just sort of a general matter and, and what I can say rooted in my own study of intersectionality, which is simply the acknowledgement that different identities intersect to create unique experiences is that um, it's very easy for me to imagine how for a trans person, 
um, the sort of gendered rules around how thin or voluptuous or whatever a body should be um, would play out and particularly vexing and potentially painful and perhaps potentially empowering ways. It's not my personal experience, but um, you know, I don't, I absolutely don't mean to erase or um, elide the complications of how fat phobia and anti-fat bias play out along the gender spectrum. I only mean to acknowledge um, that for women, and I use that term really broadly, because we have historically and continue to be so incredibly tied and publicly judged by the size and shape of our body. And because there's so much work and expectation that goes into the performance of femininity that's tied to the body, um, the cultural hammer can come down in a particularly hard and persistent way. But that can be true while it's also true that other groups have their own incredibly powerful experience and that the experience can, you know, the experiences can overlap in some ways. I hope that clarifies just a little bit um, what my thinking is. And Leo, if it doesn't, I mean, gosh, yeah, I don't know. No, I think that's great. That. It's prompting me to think of, so I'm a gay man, I'm a gay trans man, uh, and the gay male culture is really interesting when it comes to this topic because we have bears which celebrate, mm -hmm. celebrate bigness and hairiness. And a lot, of, a lot of folks find that attractive. And then we have the opposite where you need to have a ripped body to be deemed attractive. So fat phobia is very alive in the gay male community, but then there's this counterculture that right. celebrates fatness. So it's a really interesting dichotomy. Yeah, fascinating. I mean, Again, just to say, like, you could spend an hour on any of these ideas, and I just was hoping to kind of scatter some seeds, and people would grab what was interesting to them and sort of keep the conversation going internally or with, with their friends and colleagues and family Oh, members. yes, I, I can see that this has stimulated a lot of thought, and, and, and for me as well. Uh, let's get to a second question. Which is more important to dismantling fat phobia, disrupting the connection between weight and health? or challenging the emphasis slash privileging of health, quote, in quotes, as a moral goal. Mm. And then the person said, oh, you just got to the slide about this. Thank you. But if there's <laughs> anything else you want to <laughs> convey about that. Oh, gosh. I mean, I am an all, I'm, I'm like a both and more than an either or person. So um, I think they're both incredibly important. I think that... Um, where the more entrenched misinformation lies is in this reflexive association, false association between thin and healthy and fat and unhealthy. Um, I mean, health as, as a sort of moral obligation, like that's problematic for so many reasons, including the fact that we do not equally distribute the resources that are required to have metabolic, emotional, mental, and spiritual, if that's a category that matters to you, health. So they're both important, but I think the sort of um, deeper bias is around the sort of conflation of thinness and health and fatness with a state of unhealth or disease. That's just my feeling about it. Thank you. Uh, and to just remind folks, if you have a question, please put it in Q&A. We have a lot of wonderful dialogue going on in chat, and I don't want to uh, disrupt that. Uh, we have another question for Savala. Hello, I am an exercise scientist. Is, it is true that weight, shape, and size are not indicative of health status. So let's forget about aesthetics, but there is a very clear indication. I'm not sure if this is a question now. Uh, that fat percentage is related to metabolic disease risk. Additionally, exercise and diet alone do not help, but fitness health level are sustainable with exercise uh, and diet together. I should have read that. So that was more of a comment. But if there's anything you would like to reply to, 
Um, I, I disagree on the interpretation of the science and reasonable people, I suppose, can disagree. And of course, I don't know what science this person is referencing. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think what I, you know, to sort of put it in kind of lay terms that people can take with them, um, what I would want people to understand is that they cannot control the size, shape, and weight of their body for any long period of time, especially through diet and exercise, right? That doesn't mean don't eat nourishing food. Do eat nourishing food. It doesn't mean don't move your body. Do move your body, right? We know that those things support health and happiness and a sense of wholeness and a life well lived and all of that good stuff. What they don't do is control the size, shape, and weight of your body for any duration of time. So in one of the last slides, I mentioned this idea of weight neutral self-care. And the idea there is that you take care of your body and your weight is whatever it is, that those are sort of two separate categories and you can take wonderful care of your body and it may or may not change your weight, whether you're thin or fat, your weight may or may not shift as you take really good care of your body. So it's about being more neutral about the number on the scale and more intentional about the behavior while remembering that your individual behavior is just one piece of the pie of what makes you healthy. Thank you. We've got a few more questions. Uh, four, we'll try to get to them. Last, uh, how can I help dismantle fake and average gym slash fitness fat phobia other than by featuring, quote, fat athletes? Is this, is this the one from a gym? I don't, I, what was, can you just say it again? I sort of yes. missed that. How can I help dismantle fake and average gym slash fitness fat phobia other than by featuring fat athletes? Um, well, I'm, I am still curious if this person like owns a gym because when they say featuring fat athletes, that makes me feel mm. like they have some sort of platform or like they're an Instagram fitness influencer. Um, I think that featuring fat athletes is actually like not to be discounted. Um, this is a, an incredibly visual bigotry right? It's one that is sort of reflexive based on what we see and just seeing fat bodies, lifting weights, running, swimming, dancing, you know, whatever it is, that alone is, is, um, interrupts this sort of like profoundly reflexive thought process. And so I wouldn't, I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't discount the value of that. And then, you know, you always want to be hearing from the people who you're speaking about. So like to borrow a phrase from the disability community, like no conversations about us without us. So to the extent this person has a flat platform, like share, share, share the voice of the platform with fat athletes too. Um, and allow you know them to talk about the reality that metabolic health is not the same as what we call sort of cosmetic health, which is sort of thinness. I hope mm. that's a helpful answer. Yes, that's great. Uh, what is your advice about dismantling internalized fat phobia? Uh, the person indicates that your quiz surfaced a bit of that for them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, my, 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 I guess I want to spotlight two things. One is that list of people, um, the, that bullet point list that was toward the very end of the presentation, pretty much all of those people are doing that work, right? It's a, it, there's sort of two tracks that run together. It's like, there's the external work of dismantling fat phobia. And there's also the incredibly crucial inner work, whether you're thin or fat, um, and all of those people are doing both. So like, look them up, read their books, read their articles, um, engage with them on social media. And through them, you can find like more resources than you can imagine. And I will also just add, there's a, a particular organization that's near and dear to my heart called Be Nourished, Be mm -hmm. Nourished. Um, on the West Coast, and they run basically like seminars and classes around dismantling fat phobia from the inside out that have been incredibly powerful for my own journey of liberation. And I can't recommend them highly enough. If I can chat everybody, I will put it in the chat. Yeah. 
And while you do that, I'll point out that one of our participants wrote a comment in response to that. So, uh, and mentioned social media. Uh, so yes, check that out for the other participants. I'm, I'm gonna, uh, we have a couple more questions. I have a question about language. Um, I use fat in my programs and sometimes people ask why I use that term. And I explain fat liberation movement and reclaiming word much like queer. Um, but there are a whole host of other words like overweight, um, obese, like you mentioned. What's the significance in, in changing the, the language that we use from say overweight to fat? Well, I think there's a million answers to this, like depending on the person who's speaking. So I just will offer my own thoughts. Um, and I'm, there are probably fat people out there who don't want to be called fat. They want to be called full figured or plus size or, you know, whatever. So this idea of calling oneself fat and claiming it as a descriptor and sort of taking the stinger out of that word and the pathology out of that word is um, a political act, right? It's a political identity. And some people are there and they love it. And for other people, that's not where they are, right? Um, and that's okay. So I think, you know, what I can say about fatness is, is, is what I've already said. That's why I use it, you know? It's like, um, I was so terrified of being called fat for so much of my life that a really important process uh, or part of the process for me um, in terms of beginning to like and be neutral about my own body was being able to understand that fat is just a description. I'm a tall, mixed, black, fat woman with curly hair. Like that's just, it presents a picture of who I am in the world and claiming it for myself um, has been incredibly powerful. It's been just a massive release and relief to have that word at my disposal. The problem with the word overweight is like over whose weight, right? Over what weight? Um, my body weighs what it weighs. It's not over or under anything, you know? So there's a way that the phrase overweight implies um, that there's a normal standard weight. And if you're outside of it, you're deviant. And that's an unacceptable proposition to me in terms of my own politic. Um, and obesity is problematic for many folks because it's rooted in the medical pathology of fat bodies. And that's not acceptable either because I'm not a disease. I'm not a pathology. I'm not a problem to be solved. I'm not something that requires testing and experimentation. So it's a, you know, the roots of that word come from this sort of clinical gaze that views fatness as this really problematic thing. And um, those are, I mean, those are sort of the two most common words that I would hear just in like everyday talk is overweight or, or, or obese. And um, those are the reasons that I dislike those words and that many fat people I know don't use those words too. Thank you. That's exactly yeah, what I wanted you to get at. Um, uh, we are, we have one more minute, but there's a fantastic question that given your intersecting identities, I'd like to have you address. And do you think it's, sure. do you think that fat phobia is prevalent within the black community uh, this person recalls examples of Black celebrities being judged for losing weight, such as Oprah and Luther Vandross. Yeah, I mean, again, like fat phobia is everywhere. It's the water, right? It's the air. Um, so any, any subculture or any particular community is going to have to reckon with fatness and fat phobia and anti-fat bias in one way or another. Um, what I will say is in my experience as someone who has a white side of a family and a black and Mexican side of my family, um, is that my body was a huge problem for the white side of my family because I've always been a fat person and what was a fat kid and was not a problem on the black and Mexican side of my family. You know, they called me a beautiful Amazon at the same time that the white side of my family was putting me on diets, right, at the age of five. So um, I do think that there is, and I, you know, I hate to paint with a broad brush, but 
it's the nature of the question that I sort of have to. I do think that there tends to be, not always, but tends to be a little more acceptance, or at least historically, there has been more acceptance of body diversity among um, brown and black communities than white communities. Again, like painting with such a broad brush, which I'm loath to do, but the question kind of requires it. That being said, um, you know, if you sort of, if you go beneath fat phobia and anti-fat bias, insofar as there are issues of cosmetics and aesthetics, like every community has a kind of, has taste about what kind of body it prefers, right? And um, that image of the young woman from Mauritania who's part of a community that prizes fatness before marriage and all of that, like there is a way in which every community tries to exert like some control over bodies. So even if that phobia is not rampant in a particular community, there may still be aesthetic preferences that are themselves kind of made up and rooted in control and rooted in sort of political sedation and keeping people preoccupied or you know with a, with their body in a certain kind of way like the sort of slim thick aesthetic of the kardashians um so i would not i would never never say this is a white problem and black communities don't have it or anything like that it's much more complicated than that even though in my personal experience um like the question hinted at there has tended to be like a, a little more give and more generosity and more prizing of a variety of bodies um, in the Black and Mexican communities that I am part of and that I have witnessed and studied than in the white communities that I am part of and that I have witnessed and studied. Fantastic. Does that Thank help so answer yes. that question? Uh, yes, and if we didn't get to your question, I'm sorry, but uh, we're out of time. I just want to say once again, thank you so much for being here. 